is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Winter Steel, Cradle Book 8, chapters 12 and 13. In these chapters, Lyndon gets in a fight and he really thinks that pride is on the verge of death. And it turns out that basically it was the equivalent of somebody using a trick knife that sinks into the hilt and he had nothing to worry about and nearly, nearly died? Not really. Because of it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Andy for commissioning this episode. So, yeah, guys, this section is another... This is one of those things that I'm like, am I going to get tired of this? I don't think I'm going to get tired of this. But we get another bit of like, oh, hey, uh, Lyndon's got no idea what a complete badass he is. He has no real concept of how other people see him. Isn't that hilarious? And while a part of me is like, look, you can't keep doing this. It's going to get old. I'm like, will it? Because it hasn't it at all, actually. I am always here for seeing Lyndon through other people's eyes and realizing that he is truly terrifying in a way that he does not understand. He is so hard on himself and so constantly dissatisfied. And because of that, has no real perspective about how he comes across. And it's some of it is beyond his control. The fact that he looks like he's always glowering and spoiling for a fight. It's not just one character that we've heard think that. We've heard about four or five specifically use that kind of language describing how he looks in a, on a normal day. His resting bitch face is intense. And that's just when he's chilling and like thinking and considering stuff. When he's actually out here ready to kill somebody, this man is upsetting in a way that we haven't really seen anybody react to anyone in this way other than like a monarch. Even the reactions that we've seen to Athan haven't been as pronounced because most people athan has gone up against have underestimated him and he always treats the fight as a bit of a joke until the very last second when he just crushes someone so they don't often have much of a chance to be intimidated before it's over it, it, like you know obviously Aaron being like a major exception to that um so yeah I as much as a part of me is like mm, yeah but we did this I'm like I don't care I love it and I just kind of want this now. Like, I want to just watch Lyndon from other people's perspectives for the rest of the book and get hype about seeing the way he's progressing without any understanding or real knowledge of it. And it's very interesting to me that Dross from inside Lyndon's head is a factor, I think, in Lyndon feeling less than impressed with his own progress, because Dross constantly sort of mocks the way that he's like, he doesn't have the understanding, or he doesn't have, you know, whatever it is, the the kind of like, um, aspect of personality at the point at the time that he is lacking, Dross will most definitely point it out. And I feel like that has to factor in a little bit to Lyndon not being ever really feeling like he's performing up to his own standards. Um, I just really love after going up against this priest, it's an arch priest, right? Um, eventually, they are nearly killed and they escape. And he is like comforting himself with the thought that this kid 
likely is either going to die or be mutilated permanently because of what he did with his madra. And then we go back to Lyndon, and not only is he absolutely fine, he is irritated that he didn't get any points. That's the thing. He's not like, oh, God, thank God I didn't die. He's not really entirely sane, I would say. I think his points obsession has gone a tiny bit too far. And maybe he needs to step back and have a a little bit of time away. And he does get that, but not in a way that to me facilitates introspection on that sort of count. It will just foster more obsession, I would think. Um, and <sighs> he, he is just... Oh, all right. We're going to get there. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself, but I did want to talk about that because like it's it just isn't it, it's so much fun to realize how far he's come and I really wonder if cuz you know, he has to come up with another sort of um insight into himself in order to be overlord. I wonder if it isn't hunger. The hunger binding, the hunger being his path feels like a good way to describe the fact that he's never satisfied. It feels like a good way to sort of describe him always this ambition and, and whether whatever it's fueled by, you know, we know that he's fueled by this, this need to not be worthless. Nevertheless, it pushes him to a point where he just refuses to stop. And I got to be honest, you guys. I relate to this so much. And I know I've talked about this, but as somebody who does what I do for a living, most people who run a podcast, they have a show per week. Maybe, you know, maybe once every couple of weeks, especially if it's a highly edited show. And I do a, an average of 12 per week. And every time that I reach a point where I could take a break or pull back on a show, I do not do that and instead add another slot to, you know, replace that empty place with a new show, a new project, because I am uncomfortable with downtime. I am uncomfortable with rest. I don't like the the way that Grace winds up framing their sitting together and eating as maintenance and the fact that she has to frame it that way at all in order to get him to stop and take a break. I a couple of years ago, I have I have gotten better about this in the last two years. But two years ago, I was invited to a a con in California by a friend of mine who was like the president of the convention that year. It's a sort of cycling thing. And every year, a different person is in, in charge. And she was able to pay for my flight. She was able to pay for my room, get everything set up for me to go to this convention and speak on a couple of panels. And I got there and it was a four day trip. And unbeknownst to me, she had made sure that the two panels that I was on were in the middle of the day on the first day, or no, the beginning of the day, the first day, back to back. And so I was there for four days, and everything was like paid for. But I wasn't actually going to be working most of the time. And when I talked to her about it, and I was like, I didn't have to be here this whole time. She like sat me down and was like, look, I and all of your co hosts and friends have seen how much you push yourself. And you needed a break really badly. But we knew if we told you that this was a break, you wouldn't come. So we had to pretend it was for the convention in order to get you out here and trick you into taking a vacation. And when she said that, I 100% knew she was correct. I wouldn't have come if she had framed it like that. Absolutely would never have come. I was so 
I was so stressed going there already about, you know, what I was going to talk about and the way things were going to go. And since then, I have begun to really kind of see that that was a major problem for me. That was a come to Jesus moment, as they are called, where you really are everyone around you sees you making the same mistake and, and hurting yourself, really, when it comes down to it. And if even if you don't really see it, if everyone around you can see it, you have to give that some credence if you really believe those people are your friends, because they want the best for you. If you trust them, if you really think that they care about you, you have to at least listen. And they were all saying the same thing, which was, you need to slow down, you need to take a break. And they were com completely correct. And this is just something that with Lyndon, I feel it in my heart, the not wanting to take a break, this constant nagging feeling every time that you go and, and do something for pleasure, that you're losing something else. This certainty that, well, if I had just taken this time and this time on these days and, and dedicated them to X goal, I wouldn't be behind right now. And Lyndon is in a unique position where being an underlord means that he needs less sleep, Like he is genuinely physically able to continue at a, a higher pace and for longer periods without rest. And that's what's sort of so annoying is that everyone this whole time has been telling him he needs to like chill, perhaps. And all that he, his advancements are doing are equipping him to ignore their advice. And I just feel that we are cresting to a point where he's going to be forced to take a break. Something's going to happen and he's going to get really hurt or he's going to be maybe captured or forced into a position where he isn't able to train for whatever reason. And I'm not looking forward to that because it's not an easy thing to cope with when you have that kind of brain, when that's the way that you view the world. And I'm a little bit dreading it because I am dead certain it's going to happen. It's just been brought up too many times that he refuses to rest. And it's starting to like, in this section, I kind of thought maybe that's where we were heading because he acknowledges the fact that they have been pushing themselves so hard. It's kind of like wearing at his channels. And a lot of it is stuff that his iron body can cope with. And But he is noticing that it's wearing him down a bit. And yet he's able to sort of like toss that to the side. He acknowledges it in a very like intellectual distant sort of way, but he doesn't internalize like, well, maybe I should chill for an hour, you know? And um, I maybe, maybe it'll be Yaren that helps him with this. I don't know because there's nothing to put things in perspective, like realizing maybe you're about to lose somebody or you're not, you know, I don't know, but mm, I'm I'm worried about it. I don't I'm not looking forward to seeing how that shakes out. Um so all right, beginning with chapter twelve. Abyssal Palace moved over Sky's Edge and the surrounding valley like a plague. They didn't attack. Their goal wasn't to kill Akura's sacred artists, but to prepare for the coming of their dread god. So they're building all of these towers and Lyndon at first thinks that they're shelters for their people. But like later, you know, we see them literally sitting outside the tower. They're not even in it necessarily. And he's like looking around like this doesn't make any sense. And then he finds out that they are filled with scripts and they capture and store dread god Madra. So this is part of what was being talked about in Yaren's section about like using the resources that you can get for free to advance yourself, you know, and it's really interesting later when he drains somebody, how like sad the memories and the perspective are, <laughs> and we will get there. Um, so he is, this was actually really surprising to me. The fact that they weren't trying to kill sacred artists and the fact that the teams are not, their goal is not to kill members of this cult. I definitely thought that was going to be what we saw. I mean, that's what was happening before when another dread God showed up is it was just, 
you know, also there were a bunch of uh, weird blood madra monsters as well. So maybe I'm just sort of thinking about like the absolute slaughter that came with that. But it felt much more like all of our cards are on the table. We are ready to kill every single last one of you. And in this chapter, we find out that it's much more political. And it's like, I will, and by I, I'm talking about like, from Malice's perspective versus against like Reagan Shen. I will have my people resist your people. And I will make it difficult for you. But I am not going to outright kill because I am not interested in drawing your particular attention to anyone specifically. I'm just trying to erect a barrier of, of generalized resistance. And it's a little strange. I'm not certain that I feel like I understand this entirely because to me, the idea of like a war coming but you don't preemptively try and hit that army if you can, that doesn't really like compute in my brain. Um, and the idea that like, th this is obviously happening in sort of a different way than the previous Dread God did, where in that situation, the Dread God woke up rather abruptly. It wasn't expected to wake because of, you know, what, um, what's his face did? Mazakel, Machiel, right? And so the cult is actually at that point, if I'm not mistaken, following the Dread God versus laying the foundation for the Dread God to follow after. And maybe that's what's different to, to this situation is that they are, because they're coming first and they're not actually hurting anybody yet. They're laying the foundations to collect Madra from this dread God, but they're not actually waging war. Not really. It's taken for granted that that will happen eventually, but it's sort of like, they don't see that as any of their affair. You know, they're going to collect this Madra. They're going to do what they can do to advance themselves. And whether the dread God does shit, well, that's regrettable. But we're the opportunists who are just following it around, trying to get whatever, like, scraps we can. So I guess when I think about it like that, it does make some more sense. It's just it's requiring this complete shift in the way I think about the blood cults, because we just were all operating under this assumption that they were evil and fine with the massacre of innocents and whatever. And it really is starting. I'm starting to just be like, mm, yeah, I guess that's not necessarily true which is evident the evidence is that they flee practically every time they're not trying to fight they're just here to collect madra and they're like yeah i know that you hate us and i know you're going to cause a problem for us and you want us out of here Ah, uh, fine we'll go we're going to be back we're going to keep doing what we do but fine take my mask oh this is annoying um yeah and the masks are worth uh, seven points a piece the average Abyssal Palace construction team was made up of three or four acolytes with one higher value priest. That meant at least 46 points per team. Um, so I, I do love to the descriptions of the masks as being like barely carved. They're not these incredibly intricate things. It feels like stuff that was sort of churned out. Um, and how these like teams that are fighting against them are really not up to snuff to go out against Lyndon's team. And it does get me sort of comfortable so that when he finally finds some people who really present a challenge to him later, it does come as a bit of a shock. It was a bit of, it caught me by surprise. Um, so let's see. B -b -b Fury didn't mind this sort of combat because their entire objective was to slow Abyssal Palace down, not eradicate them. Um, so... At this point, Lyndon is up against this dude and he says, I will happily let you go, but there's one thing I'd like to try first. Lyndon put his hunger Madra hand on the man's head. From Lyndon's pocket, Little Blue channeled Madra into him. He drained power from the man, cycling the heart of twin stars as he did so. 
A rush of different energies flowed into Linden, and he and Draw separated them together, processing them according to the heart of twin stars. But unlike when Linden had tested this on remnants and dread beasts, this influx hit him like a runaway horse. The priest convulsed and fell backward, and Linden let him go. It was taking all his mind and spirit to control the technique. Soulfire and pure Madra streamed into his spirit, blood essence suffused his body, and yellow and brown Madra vented from his arm. The earth around him shook in response, but by far the most disturbing were the memories. For a moment, Linden's point of view doubled. He was standing over the priest, and he was lying on the ground, wondering what the young underlord had done to him. He wished his son was safe, dreamed that the treasures unearthed by the dread god would be enough to take him to Overlord, and wondered when he could go home. Then he realized he was in an unfamiliar body. It was taller, broader, younger, with pure Madra flowing powerfully through it, and the arm of a remnant. Pure Madra didn't respond to any of his cycling techniques. Whoops, hang on, I was supposed to handle the memories, wasn't I? I'll filter them and give you what you need to know, that's my fault. Uh, yikes. I really, there is something about finding out that somebody is just like worried about their family and doing their best that humanizes them to a way that I don't like, I'm never comfortable with when you have just gotten very accustomed and comfortable with the fact that they are the bad guy. And there's a sense of that here with Lyndon of him being like, God damn it. I really wish that I could have done this without getting those bits of memory without in taking in parts of like who he is and remembering that sort of thing. And as much as Dross is like helping him separate those out later on, he's still able to recall things. It's not flawless. Dross isn't able to collect everything and completely compartmentalize it the way that Lyndon would like. And while a part of me is hoping that he will eventually advance enough that he can do that, Another part of me feels like this might be good for Lyndon because he is somebody who he can get so greedy and hungry about advancing that re being reminded that these are people is probably not a bad way to go, you know, for somebody like that. Because it, I think it might be easy to lose that perspective and just see everybody as a level up and not as people anymore. And also... I feel like this might because like Lyndon is out here fighting these guys and he doesn't have the benefit of the uh, conversations and encounters that Yaren has had. And so she's a little bit ahead of him in recognizing that some of these people aren't as bad as she thought. She's in early stages of that and not completely ready to like come to terms with what it means. But she has seen the first indicators and I like that maybe these are some indicators for him so that they won't be on completely different pages when they talk again, because, you know, it's, it's d difficult when you've had more time to process something that goes directly counter to everything you've known. And then you try to talk to a friend about it who hasn't got any of that information and they haven't had time to get thoughtful about it. And you just sort of get impatient waiting for them to catch up with you. And I am hoping that maybe this will you know how uh, it might actually put him ahead of her because he's getting such a more firsthand perspective than she even is. Um, but you know, that's all assuming that that comes up at all anytime soon. Um, so all of these people are uh, like his team are watching him and are a little bit horrified clearly at what he just did. And he tries to put them off and be like, we'll talk about it later. But they get on the the cloud ship and it's very clear they are not going to drop it. And finally, he says, I can steal power. It's not a complete technique. It needs work. And Narusea <laughs> says, Narusea made a fist as though she wanted to grab his neck with it. And that works. You can just take someone's advancement. It's more complicated than that, but. It works. I gained weeks worth of advancement in my pure core just from what I did back there. It can replace cycling and then some. I gained a little soul fire too and my body's stronger. Although, teach me. Ah, well, apologies, but 
I have pure madra. I could still use it on wind artists. The hunger binding is part of me now. I'll give up an arm. And I really do 100% believe her when she says that. If she were told, I'll chop your arm off and replace it with like a hunger binding arm, and then you'll be able to do this. I have no doubt Narusea would be like, fine, here, just instantly. Um, so Dross, not understanding that this is coming across as sarcasm. That's a wonderful idea. Now, the way we have it worked out, you need a soul enforcer technique to sort the Madra, an advanced sylvan river seed to purify, and a mind spirit without peer to sort the residual memories. Oh, and your body needs to be sturdy enough to handle an influx of blood essence without tearing itself apart. But I fully encourage you to try. Maybe you'd survive. Sometimes there is no better rebuttal than the truth. <laughs> Just spoken plainly. Um... And she says, you don't have to take that tone. What tone? It's a splendid idea. I, for one, am delighted that you would risk your body for research. And it turns out that everybody was kind of feeling the way Narusea is. They're all sort of like, can I do that, though? Can you teach me how to do that? Mm, no. And Pride says, you should give your notes to the clan Soulsmiths. We have plenty of Dread Beast bindings. This might be the development that gives us an edge over our enemies. Of course, Lyndon said brightly. I'll trade you for the complete blueprint of your book. <sighs> that is such a good answer. Because he is saying this like they have ownership over Lyndon. There's like this entitlement here of just like, well, if you have the knowledge, you should share it with us. Bitch, why? He was taken in by your family for the tournament. He hasn't been adopted. He, you know, although it does look like they're low-key like kind of wanting to do that we'll get there um and it turns out that Daoji and courage are actually a little bit worried that eventually linen will do this to them and based on how everybody is of the same mind when they look at linden and think that he looks like he's really spoiling for a fight if people haven't gotten to know him very well, it's understandable why they would assume he's going to use this on them eventually because they don't trust him and they don't understand what a sweet cinnamon roll he is. You know, like, it's just, I mean, why would you? A guy with this kind of ability also being humble in the way that Lyndon is, is so extraordinarily rare. And that's the one thing I maintain that makes Lyndon such a compelling character. And this is a very, very difficult thing to pull off. And many authors can't do it. Having a character slowly become more and more badass while they are unaware they are badass really doesn't happen. It's not something that it's it, that you can convince me of frequently. Usually it's like kind of a combo of the author dumbing down the, the character and making them fail to see what people are saying to them in a way that feels totally inaccurate. Like if you are working on things and people keep on making sort of comments, a lot of times in books that I've read, they will purposefully misunderstand the comment or misinterpret what was meant by it in a way that feels so incredibly unbelievable. But it's that author attempting to explain to us how they could be unaware of their own ability and the impression that they give to other people. With Lyndon, he hears what people are saying, and he understands the meaning behind it. But he values himself little enough that he just thinks they're mistaken. As we see later, like Charity says something to him about how he's eventually going to be a significant power. That's the word she uses. And North Strider agrees with her. So we have a sage and a monarch both telling Lyndon, you're going to be important. And he's like, mm, am I? Because I don't see it. But thank you. And can you give me presents? And like, honestly, it's it's hard because... You want to slap and shake him, but he is just this amazing combination of ambitious and full of imposter syndrome. 
And ah, oh, just another way in which he's very relatable. All of this success that he is having, and it's just not really enough for him to buy it, to really believe that he's like getting where he's going. He sees in an objective sort of way when he steps back, wow, I left home and I hadn't even reached copper. And now I'm an underlord. And that's amazing. But really, he isn't that impressed by it. It's like the kind of thing that you could say, well, it sounds good on paper, but it's not really like, you know. <sighs> so we go to Lyndon um, and he's messing around with Daji's armor here. Uh, and we find out a little bit later all of the things that he's been doing messing with armor. But at this point, he has made this like shelter for himself. And uh, it looks like a barn. And he's thinking about how Fisher Gesha would like it. Um. He notices his remnant hand is trembling and Dross is looking at it like that's not the memories. I'm, I have them locked up. And Lyndon says his oldest son was born during a thunderstorm. And well, they're all locked away except for the ones that aren't obviously. Okay, Dross. <laughs> um, it feels like your arm is coming to life. Lyndon says, can we stop it? Ah, but hear me out. What if we evolved it to the next level? We brought me to life and look how helpful I am. Imagine how much, much less lonely it'd be if there was someone else in here. <sighs> Lyndon's remnant arm having a life of its own feels like a blood shadow, but like worse somehow because it's attached to you in a way that's no, 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 I don't like it. That's not to say we can't find a way to make that work. But as of the place where I'm standing right now, Mm -mm. No, sir. Not interested. Um, so sudden growth was hard to control. He used techniques constantly all day and his wounds had still taken strength from him. Integrating new blood essence burdened him now as eating high quality sacred beast meat always had. And though his iron body could handle it, the burden was adding up. But he blinked the fatigue away. There were points to earn. Yeah, kid. We'll see. Mm hmm. We'll see how that's happening, how that goes. So he gets interrupted here uh, by Grace, who is telling him we're about to eat if you'd like to join us. And she sees that he's working on armor and they get into this little conversation. And um, this was honestly my my first indicator that she's maybe a little bit into him, which we find out she's the one who suggested a marriage to charity. But she she sees what he's doing and gets excited about it and like steps in and chats with him for a while about what she did and the way that she handled things. And I do, it's not like she's flirting with him necessarily, but there is an openness to her and an interest in what he's doing that feels very genuine. And I could definitely see how somebody who isn't aware that he's involved with somebody – would think this signifies a connection between you two, you know? Um, and I really like, if it weren't for Yaren being involved, I would think, Oh, I could see that this kind of works between the two of them. You know, Grace seems like we don't know her well, but she seems like a pretty intelligent and level headed person. She's talented. She's not like, incredibly advanced, but she's good enough that she made it to the backup team, which is pretty fucking impressive. And um, overall, I would not think that she was a bad match. It's just, you know, she she's late. That's all there is to it. He found somebody already. Um, and I don't know whether somebody for, with her background would be able to connect with Lyndon in the ways that Yaren is, because Yaren has a sort of like, this fear of abandonment and desire for stability in relationships, not necessarily stability in like setting up a house and home, although she has expressed interest in that, that when you are born with that kind of privilege already, you may take it for granted and not necessarily understand the drive that comes from not having it. And that is part of where I think the deep connection between Lyndon and Yaren is, is both of them having felt like they really only had like one person in the world that was on their side ever. Um, and they just really were, they both 
had some real hardship. And that's not to say that Grace never had any. We don't know anything about her history. But she grew up in a rich family. She obviously was given a lot of advantages. And so there are ways in which when you are dating somebody, I speak from experience, who comes from that sort of background, there are moments where you just are really struck by how differently you see the world because of the things that you had or didn't have when you were young. And that's just something that you never quite can shake. It just will come up at odd moments. Um, so, you know, despite all of that, I'm not saying that they wouldn't be a good match, but it would be interesting to see how that sort of thing might come up in their relationship and if it would be an obstacle or not. Um, let's see. Mordecai says she's right under pride. Number three, she was the only Akura underlord who wasn't a tank. Uh, Evil says Grace did not get a book, so she wasn't one of the top Akura growing up. She had to work her way up. Mordecai says, yeah, wasn't she like extended family? I mean, regardless, if you're an Akura, you've got advantages. It's just like inherent, but regardless. Okay. So, um, at this point, they they have this little conversation where he uh, says something about her not taking care of her weapon and then realizes that he's being kind of rude. This is when she says, um, come outside and do some maintenance. And Dross says, ouch, in response to her saying this, which um, I don't know why that's his response. It, like when you say ouch, it's like, it implies that somebody just like burned you a little bit, but I don't feel like she is doing that here. It felt like she's genuinely just trying to put taking a break and eating a meal into terms that he understands. But maybe that's what Dross means is like, ooh, did you hear the way that she had to like rephrase this because you're such a fucking robot that she's like, okay, let me try and talk about you like you're a machine, you know? Um, so they get the diamond veins. And I love pride being like, you can't take it. You can't do it, sir. We can't give exclusive prizes to anyone until we earn as many as we can. You said that this was your idea. We could have cashed them all in for scales. Pride plucked the divine treasure from his hands. I don't need this, so I'll hold on to it. Mercy wouldn't forgive you if you gave into temptation. Lyndon thought it was strange how much pride brought up his sister's opinion, especially related to Lyndon. Oh, Lyndon, he still hasn't figured it out. Um, but he is kind of like, well, you're right. She wouldn't like that. And he, it, I mean, it doesn't, it, it does like still sink in and work a little bit, just not in the way that pride intends it to work. Um, and he and pride are heading out because the two of them are like the, um, probably the strongest in direct combat and they are going to head out against this particular tower that I'm trying to find that it's at two crossed canyons, which um, I'm really curious about this. It feels like maybe the canyons serve as like rivulets to collect blood madra in a way that it's like very practically physically obvious, but might not occur to you if that's not the way that you collect Madra yourself. It's just there's something significant clearly about these canyons that we haven't found out here. Um, so they're sneaking up on the place. And there are a couple of people that are sitting outside the tower. And pride jumps down and like kind of prematurely attacks. And Lyndon's a bit irritated with this. And a priestess comes out. She has one of those gold eyes in her mask. And we find out later that like two gold eyes means a uh, arch priest. And she says, use your gate stone. We would rather not hurt you. This moment is so funny in retrospect, knowing now that pride was not in trouble. Um, Lyndon's gate stone, like a lump of sparkling blue chalk, was already in his hand, but pride was too slow. He shouldn't have been. He was a master of enforcer techniques. He should have been faster than Lyndon. But he had hesitated to retreat in front of the enemy, so the high priest was already out of the doorway and holding a dagger to his throat. 
The two yellow eyes turned to Lyndon. Not you. Drop it or we will kill him. Perfect, Dross said. Let's leave him. Dross hates this motherfucker so much. Honestly, I like it. I find it really funny how much he hates him. I have grown to like grudgingly respect Pride a little bit more because I really fucking hated him initially. It feels like he's more willing to cooperate now than he was before because Lyndon's proved himself a little bit. So I don't feel about him the way I did. But honestly, the fact that Dross is still as pissed as he was originally, I'm here for it, to be to be perfectly honest. Um, so Lyndon whips the gate stone at Pride and the dude who has him by the th- by like with the knife it looks like manages to cut Pride's throat before he disappears. So Lyndon spends a bunch of the rest of this worried about whether Pride even survived. And we find out Pride is like absolutely not in danger at all here. But Lyndon didn't know that. And I love too that Pride is like, you know, you wasted a gate stone. I know you hate that. So just don't next time. I'll be fine. Like it's a combo of him mocking Lyndon a little bit. And also being irritated at how much Lyndon underestimated him, which I could understand. You know, Pride is like, he isn't at Lyndon's level, clearly, but he could take care of himself to a degree that somebody like just getting the drop on him with a knife, it does in retrospect seem a little bit, uh, a little bit shitty for Lyndon to really think that worked on him. You know, I, I could see being a little insulted by that. So... He was in real danger here, but nothing he hadn't seen before. There were points to be earned. He didn't have little blue out to power his new techniques, but he had fought this far without them. He may not have been one of the uncrowned, but that didn't mean he was helpless. So (laughs) he gets into this fight. I won't go beat by beat, but I will say that eventually draw straight up tells him to run. And while you're running, try to observe it more because I'm very curious myself. Um, The high priest was dashing at him like a bull, eyes glowing. And he's so he's getting attacked by this dude and by the priestess. And he has his uh, wave dancer, which he is able to like, I'm really unsure if I have this right. But the way that I picture wave dancer working is basically it whips out of Lyndon's soul space or his void key, his void key. And basically just like slices through the air completely independent of Lyndon's because it's under Dross's control in this section. So does Wave Dancer just kind of fight as if a person was holding it? And that is crazy town. That's not fair. Shit. Um, So Lyndon takes a hit from this priest that he says, uh, like he thinks to himself, was like being hit by a a collapsing castle. The, uh, The enforced shield cracked, as did the outer shell of Lyndon's armor. Pain flooded through his body. He was forced to one knee and dust blasted away from him as the ground around his feet splintered. And I love that this is immediately followed up by more than anything else. It reminded him of taking a direct hit from Yaren at her full power. Ah, no greater compliment than almost being killed and being like, this reminds me of my girlfriend. Shit. Honestly, I really hope that I inspire that level of respect and fear in my fiance. I hope. I can only hope and dream. (laughs) Oh, God. So when we go, like, eventually, Lyndon puts on this fucking armor. And as it turns out, it's basically like six pieces that interconnect in what is described as a circuit that gets completed once they have all connected completely. And this shit is 
banana pants. This is like he just turns into Iron Man for a second. And I almost felt sorry for this this priest. His name is Moran. And when we go into chapter 13, we are in his POV. It was a point of pride that he hadn't lost a duel against anyone else at his own stage in 20 years. Uh, and it says that he gave up the the hope of reaching Overlord. Um, so he hits Lyndon with the Staff of Condemnation. Which, guys, honestly, that name, it's one of those where I'm really on the fence. Is that awesome or hilarious? I can't decide. I keep going back and forth. I can't, like, do I hate it or is it amazing? I don't know. I really haven't gotten there yet. I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, and this staff is just kind of like his ace in the hole. Every time he's used this, that's been it. It's never failed. And it says new overlords were often surprised that they couldn't endure one of his swings until the young man had blocked it. Then a black helmet covered his face and Moran felt something he never felt from an underlord. Danger. Moran had seen the early parts of Brother Aiken's training. He kept up with news from the Uncrowned King tournament, so he knew who Lyndon was. He just hadn't paid the boy any special attention. That was starting to feel like a mistake. He swept the staff of condemnation in from the side, but an archlord flying sword deflected him. He hadn't had the time or attention to spare to activate the binding in the staff, so the sword was enough to stop him. By that time, gold light was rising from the seams of the young underlord's armor. It felt like half a dozen sacred artists, all enforcing themselves at once. Moran's wariness grew to full-blown alarm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fair. So, Ira, the name of the priestess that's also fighting Lyndon at this time, tosses down this, like, construct thing, which it turns out Moran also has one. And it's, like, basically a stone cage that pops up out of the earth. And Moran is way too complacent as this gets thrown into place and contains Lyndon for a moment, that this will be it. There's no way that he's getting out of here. And as he's saying, don't worry about it. Lyndon busts through the fucking walls of it. Um, and if Ira had been standing in the way, she would have been shredded. So Moran is just like, good God. And he goes for the activated Staff of Condemnation, fueling the embrace of the Titan with soul fire. The butt of his staff slammed into the black breastplate in a blow that would have collapsed a castle wall. It was like throwing a fistful of straw at a bull. So Moran does this thing, which I think is like similar to what we saw Kiro do, where he basically enforces himself so that he doesn't get pushed backward. And when Lyndon went up against Kiro, he intended to like throw him back and Kiro did not move. That was like one of the few surprises that he really had up his sleeve. And it doesn't work for Moran the way that it had worked for Kiro. He gets pushed back, which is not something that should happen. And um, the flying sword of his, that flying sword of his flashed at Moran's back and Ira managed to deflect it with a striker technique, but it only banked around for another attack. Lyndon drew his fist back and Moran felt his own death approaching. At the risk of damaging his own channels, he poured all the madra he could into another striker technique. The eruption ring technique had been modeled on one of the Dread God's powers. It released a wall of Madra all around, shoving enemies back, and with great control, it could be focused on one direction. The wave of yellow power splashed over the armored man like water. He crashed through with his fists swinging. <sighs> his back crashed into the side of a plateau. He made a crater in the rock. This is very like Looney Tunes. His embrace of the Titan faded. His mask cracked in half. He stared blankly forward, two days to feel much pain or anything. A black visor turned to him and then Ero was there. And she wraps herself around him, 
and crushes a gate stone and they escape and they barely made it. I figure as much as Lyndon and Pride were like, well, we're not here to kill people. Probably Lyndon would have just killed them. I am assuming that's what have got, would have happened here because they were really going at him ready to kill. So I think that he would have responded in kind. Um, his ribs were fractured, his arms useless, and he couldn't feel his legs. Ira struggled to her feet, groaning, and then he saw that her sleeve was a ragged, bloody, empty mess where her left arm used to be. Yikes, man! And his staff of condemnation is broken in half, insult to injury. This was his ace up his sleeve, and it's fucking busted. Oh, that hurts, man. That hurts. That sucks. Ah. <laughs> uh. He had thought of the competition, uh, Uncrowned King, as a way to prove their value to Reagan Shen and for his apprentice to gain experience, but Moran knew Brother Aiken's strength better than anyone. He had practically raised the boy. Aiken could not handle opponents like this, and this boy hadn't even made it into the top eight. And this is when he says that Lyndon had given his life for this temporary power. If he wasn't dead now, he'd be crippled for life. Moran consoled himself with that knowledge. Oh, sweetie. And Ira really thinks she, she tells him his name and Moran's like, we struck a great blow killing him. They will want revenge. And I'm just like, honey, I, you really count your chickens, baby cakes. Like, I mean, it's amazing. Because what we have seen thus far most of the time with Lyndon is he gets into these fights that he didn't ask for, that he didn't really want, but circumstantially winds up somewhere and a person, you know, Lyndon just like manages to pull something off that he shouldn't have been able to pull off. And somebody takes that as an insult and they're like, well, you're my mortal enemy now and I have to punish you. And we get an inverse here where I think they're going to come at them even harder because they assume that Lyndon is the one in this situation who's going to say, oh, well, you're my mortal enemies, clearly. But it would be his family that would do this, obviously, because they think Lyndon's dead. They're kind of thinking the way that Lyndon did when he, like, felt he had killed Pride, that it was, like, solely his responsibility. We know that, like, North Strider could have saved, or not Pride, Harmony. Um, It wasn't, like, North Strider could have saved Harmony and didn't. So in the end he isn't held as responsible as he may have otherwise been. But Lyndon didn't know that at the time and was very worried about it. And that's how these guys are acting. And I feel like that's going to be bad news. And Lyndon's just going to be tired and not really interested in doing this. And I wonder if maybe they'll back off when they see he's alive or if they'll think like, Oh, he's alive. That's so much worse. <laughs> Cause now he's going to come at us by him, like himself to get back at us. <sighs> And if I were them, I don't think I wouldn't feel the same way, you know? Um, so then we go to Lyndon, who is upset at the damage that his armor has taken and thinking about exactly how much it's going to cost to get it repaired, how fragile the armor is. Um, he says the Madra layers in the armor, they can't handle the resonance. So the armor tears itself apart instead of a sacred instrument. It's like strapping simple constructs all over my body to which Dross says, what's so wrong with that? You could be the construct man. That would certainly be memorable. And honestly, that feels very Iron Manny to me. Like it feels like a bit of a remnant or a uh, reference, a bit of a remnant. Lol. Um, I can't help but think there's one technique that would provide the same benefits without being so complicated. I feel like that's a hint that I maybe should be like processing and putting together my theories on it. But I got to be honest, I'm not dedicating any thought to that. Um, it only costs you points to make an entire team retreat. His pure core was still almost half full, which I have to admit, guys, I was shocked by that. It says like that it would drain his core dry. In when he starts putting the armor on and it didn't even come close. Wow. His black flame core virtually untouched. His Madra channels were sore, but no more so than after a day of hard exercise and his body had handled the strain of all those enforcer techniques unscathed. He could fight another battle immediately if he had to, thanks to the effects of heaven and earth. Uh, 
what? I, that was for me the most shocking thing that he could literally go and fight again, and, like right away. This felt like a real battle to me. I was worried about him. And I didn't need to be at all. I mean, what has happened? God, he's a monster. Um, so this is when he goes and finds Pride and that Pride is totally fine. And Pride is sort of irritated with him. And then Charity shows up to pick him up and she can tell that he doesn't really want to go. And she offers to let him stay. And I'm sort of like, at the time, I thought she's just reading his body language. But now I'm sort of wondering if it isn't that she was like hoping he would spend more time with Grace, maybe. Um, so they they take their trip back. And this is when she asks, have you gotten to know any of your team members? And I was like, oh, boy, I immediately sensed where this was going. And she's straight up when she asks, like, what's your opinion on Grace? He says, well, she's performed well. I trust her judgment. She says, what if we allowed you to marry her? And he's like, what? Uh -huh. <laughs> he says, well, that she has to have better prospects. How many better prospects do you imagine there are? The sage asks. You must know that you caught my grandmother's attention. She instructed us to tie you to the family, and this would be the easiest way. Wow, marriage is easy. I had always imagined a lot of nonsense building up to it, but this is nice and fast. You should do it. Dross, shut up. <laughs> if I were going to get like a sticker or a like a t-shirt made for the Cradle series, it would just say, Dross, shut up. That would be it. That would be the main thing. <laughs> so finally, like he, she tells him about how he'll become a significant power. It's our, in our best interest to tie ourselves to you. Yada, yada, yada. She brought this up and he finally like says, I appreciate your honesty. And she's like, okay, great. But, let me get your honesty because she can tell clearly like he's not excited about this. And finally, he's like, I'm only interested in Yaren. That's it. And she's like, fuck, I knew we waited too long. I could see it. The two of you. Fuck. Oh, well. And I appreciate that she's not trying to like, in like get in there. She's not trying to plant doubts in his mind. She's not attempting to be like, well, but she's not as good a choice. She's not trying to convince him of anything. She recognizes that it's just they miss their shot pretty much. And uh, I appreciated that. Now that is not to say this won't come up again because I am certain that now that this has been floated, there were, there are going to be some things like mentioned and put out there. But uh, I just really liked how her handling of it in this moment, in this scene. And I also appreciate her being like, well, look, I respect that you're into urine, but like from from one powerhouse to another, she is extremely eligible and you better move quick because she's talented. She's hot and she's out there like, you know, a amongst a bunch of other artists. So probably you should like get on that. And I really love his going. I don't think that's my greatest concern. Look, that is some big dick energy right there. That he says, pardon if this sounds too proud. And like, I could see it sounding too proud if it were anyone else. But with Lyndon, like we know that's true. And him saying it is the only real sense of like, self-assuredness and satisfaction that we have ever gotten from him. When it comes to the sacred arts, he doesn't have confidence and is always wanting more and never feels like he's quite measured up. But talk about urine. And he's like, that's solid that I don't need to worry about that. We're good. And I love that for him. That's awesome. Like, what a great place to be. Um, so their little trip gets interrupted by North Strider. And I really appreciate charity is like, he tries to be like, you're dismissed. And she's like, hey, we're on the same side. How about you don't be a rude dickhead? 
it's not necessary and it doesn't help. And he stops and is kind of like, hmm, yeah, okay, thank you. You can go. And she's like, thank you. I like that a little interaction. Um, so he pulls Dross into this thing again. Um, I would like you to attempt some simulations and to show me the true extent of your predictive capabilities. When he comes back out, Dross is like, that was really hard. Holy shit. But there are no further memories, just like general information, which I have no doubt we will get to like explore a little bit more later on. Um, so at this point, North Strider asks Lyndon about, you know, he's like, you used my technique. Has Dross helped you overcome the effects? And Lyndon tries to fucking dry bag a little bit here where he's like, mm, I mean, he has, but my Madra channels, man, are like really torn up and it's, uh, it'd be great if somebody could like, you know, give me some diamond veins for free. Just saying. And I love North Strider. Just like your Madra channels. Good. What does that mean? If you continue to use it on the battlefield, you could reach Overlord in a matter of weeks. I want to know what he means by that. Your Madra channel's good. Why? Okay. North Strider has responses to things I don't understand. Um, and he asks Lyndon if he's investigated the Overlord revelation. Uh, Lyndon says... So from what I understand, Underlord med is meditating on the past, Overlord on the present, Archlord on the future. And North Strider says, that is the path for you. Consider yourself as you are now. What is the nature of the will that drives you? What principles guide your Madra? Yes, that is the way. And I have to assume he gets it because it's hunger. I just feel like that's what it is. I don't know. I may be super wrong. Um... And this is when he talks about how the Nine Cloud Court has thrown themselves behind Reg and Shen, but that's very like theoretical. They're not actually offering a lot of material support. And they can do that because this is all kind of a hypothetical threat to them. They don't live near the territory that is going to be targeted, so they don't care about it, really, is kind of what it comes down to. And then he says something about the Eight Man Empire. And we find out a little bit more about them later, but he basically is like the eight man empire is going to assess what direction things are going and they're going to go, they're going to back the winner. Basically, whomever it is that comes out on top of this tournament is probably going to get their support. And he has nothing but disdain for that. He really is not happy about it, but that's the way it is. And, uh, Lyndon says, I only wish I could still influence the tournament. And North Strider replies with, do not pretend you don't understand that situation. The placements were a game among all eight factions. And the world will not end with this tournament, nor even with the awakening of the dread gods. One day you may become an asset. I mean, he does understand the situation, but it also feels like you want him to influence the tournament. And I'm not entirely sure how he can do that either. It was an odd response. Again, North Strider feels like he's having a different conversation. Um, and I've met people like this who it's like, am I, I feel like you're not even responding to the words I'm saying. I feel like you're having a whole other chat. And this is when Lyndon says, rather than honored, he was growing suspicious what had he done recently to attract their attention? Or did he treat him this way just because he earned top 16 in the tournament? Again, he just doesn't like, he doesn't see it. It's not that he doesn't hear what this guy is saying and interpret it like at face value initially. He's not an idiot the way that many characters like this can be, but he just doesn't have the confidence to really believe it. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of us can relate to that. Um, both of you continue your training. You should have new insights to pursue. And Lyndon leaves and tries to go see Yaren. And he is basically told until we're done with this round, you're not going to get to see her. Uh, the under the uncrowned have been separated for the duration of the fifth round. That sucks. He came back just to see her. That's why he left and stopped like pursuing points was specifically to see her. And now he's not being allowed to do that. 
I would be so irritated. Oh my God, I would just die. And then we get the eight man empire. And essentially what this is, is people had decided that maybe they could experiment with getting like, because a, uh, let's say I'm going to just read this. If monarchs are those who have who have advanced both to herald and to sage, why not link a sage with a herald? Surely they would then together exert the power of a monarch. It turns out the strain is too much for two people. But eight people have figured out a way to share the strain between them using these like enchanted suits of armor which a lot of people have suspected the Abaddon were involved in making. It's something that just, it's so advanced. It doesn't really make sense that anybody like was able to ever figure this out when so many people have tried over the years, you know, um, the path of the eightfold spear is unique in all the world. And the eight man empire is always on the lookout for heirs to inherit their positions in the event of death or ascension. Their suits of armor can be passed down and repaired, but not replaced. Their experiment has never been successfully repeated. And that's the end of chapter 13. So they can share all of their techniques with each other. So it looks like it's one path, but really it's just a collection of paths that they can pick and choose because of the fact that they share with each other, which is really interesting. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely curious to see more of them. There are so many facets to this world. It's big. Um, so I have to wrap them over time as usual. But thank you again very, very much to Andy for commissioning this episode. I really appreciate y'all hanging out with me in the chat as well. And um, hopefully I will see you Friday with a new episode. That is when it is scheduled. I, like I said, I may have COVID. It, we will see. And if I do, I will have to postpone it until next week. But um, I will keep you all posted on whether or not that has to happen. So we'll see. Thank you again so much, everyone. And toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.